right. Well, it is three o'clock. We will go ahead and get started. Um, I am Amber Thaling. I'm one of the attorneys at Casey Elder Law. Been here mm, about 19 years, give or take. And also have a master's in social work, actually, as does Rachel. And so I'm going to let her introduce herself. My name is Rachel Swathy, and I um, have been with the firm over four years. Before that, I was um, in private practice, and um, I've been practicing law now for almost 20 years. So, and again, also have my master's in social work, um, like Amber. So we both have our master's in social work and our law degrees. And so what we're going to talk today, I'm going to probably focus really more on the power of attorney, what the financial, the health care, the differences, what they look like. And then Rachel's also going to speak to guardianship conservatorship. Um, a lot of people are told that they need a guardianship conservatorship when actually powers of attorney can be done. Um, the type we typically do when it comes to finances is a durable general power of attorney. And for finances, you could also, the other option is a springing power of attorney, which means it is only in place at a person's incapacity. In our world, we don't like that very much because frequently our clients are not incompetent, they just start to need help. Um, for example, client was in a nursing home, granddaughter was helping, uh, an annuity or life insurance policy had to be cashed in. Well, really, grandma wasn't incompetent, but she needed her granddaughter's help. If it had been a springing power of attorney, she would have had to be declared incompetent or manage it on her own. Um, so our world is a little different, but you talk to five attorneys, you're gonna get five opinions on what they think is best. And then healthcare is a little different. It is only in place when you can no longer make your own decisions and a doctor has to make that determination. Another document is a living will or healthcare directive, and those are your end of life decisions. Um, there are a lot of people ask us about DNRs that do not resuscitate. Those orders have to be ordered by a physician. So that's a separate issue from what we do. And then back to the power of attorney, you've got options on how you structure it. Um, some families, it makes sense to have, you know, you know, Amber, then Rachel, then Susan, then Johnny. The way my family works, actually my mom has Alzheimer's. And my dad has been her power of attorney and that works, but he was then diagnosed with Parkinson's. And even though he's doing very well, that we updated her so that it's my dad, my sister, or myself. Down the road, he may want our help. She may no longer have capacity to change it. And then he can have us step in to help him out. So he trusts us right now, we stay out of it. But if he wants our help later, he can have it. So at a certain point with clients, that can make sense. Um, when you're talking about a married couple, usually it's each other, then other family members or children. It doesn't have to be family. Not all clients trust their families. So sometimes having somebody different <laughs> is actually a better idea because you need to trust the people that you appoint, that they will honor your wishes, who really is going to step up to the plate. Because sometimes the child that, you know, makes the most sense is local, the other ones are out of town, but the local one isn't helping, so it doesn't make sense to list them, even because they're local. Sometimes out of town people make more sense, and with technology today, you can pretty much get anything done. Um, sometimes a pecking order makes sense. Um, my husband's family, there's four kids, they all get along, love each other to pieces, but he has two brothers that are night and day. One would probably undo the other because his idea was better. They're good people, they would honor the parents' wishes, absolutely, but would have very different perspectives. So in that situation, having an order to it, one, then two, then three, actually does make the most sense in that situation. That is the really quick highlights of powers of attorney, financial and healthcare. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'm trying to figure out, if not Rachel, we'll then talk about the guardianship conservatorship. I don't see questions. Oh, nope. Okay. So if you have a question, just type it in and we'll get to it eventually. Okay. You're up. All right. So I will just briefly talk about then an alternative to the power of attorney and uh, would be the guardianship and conservatorship. And they are, sometimes I've had family members call me and tell me that the facility maybe that their loved one is in, um, at the care facility, 
that they're being told um, that the loved one needs to get a guardianship or conservatorship. And really, it is a last um, step for us. We would much rather have a power of attorney in place than have to go to the court and have to petition for the court to appoint somebody to make decisions. Um, so we, I've actually had some cases where um, after talking to potential family members who call and say, hey, I have a, you know, an aunt or an uncle or mom or dad who needs to have a guardianship or conservatorship. And then I ask some more questions and the more we talk, it actually sounds like their loved one could maybe still appoint somebody to make decisions for them underneath a power of attorney. So maybe that loved one who's in a care facility can't actually manage their own affairs and they do need help, but they still have enough capacity to say, you know, I know that this is my daughter. I know what my estate consists of. I trust my daughter to act on my behalf. And so we've actually been able to sometimes get, uh, have with the consultation of a doctor to confirm that the person has the ability to still appoint an agent um, be able to avoid having to go to court to have a judge make that determination. And the reason why that's something that we would prefer um, is it, it really is allowing the person to make their own decisions still. They have control of what happens and who's making those choices rather than a judge having to make those choices and decisions. And when you go to the court and ask for a guardianship or conservatorship, it is much more involved. Um, you have to file a petition. It requires that you send that petition to family members. You have to present evidence. It's much more time involved and has a lot more legal fees associated with it than doing a power of attorney. So, uh, and once you have a guardianship or conservatorship, it's not an easy document to just get. And then after you have it, you have to do reports to the court. You have to do a reporting of assets. Often courts require what we call a bond, which can be expensive. It's 125% of uh, the assets often is what's required. Um, you have to get orders to sell real property. So even though you have an order from a court appointing you a guardian or conservator, often you have to still continue to go back to court. And I always err on the side of caution. Um, and get judges permission to do major things like sell property. Um, and in fact, in the statute, there are specific things that you have to get permission from the court to do. So even though you're granted a guardianship, you don't have full, uh, you don't have the ability to do certain things that you might actually be able to do underneath a power of attorney. So the, I, you know, and sometimes family members come to us and there's really, there's not an alternative They've waited too long. Sometimes, you know, different circumstances, no, you know, no fault of anybody. Um, sometimes it just happens quicker than what you anticipate that a loved one loses capacity. Um, and so sometimes that's our only option is to file with the court to get a guardianship and conservatorship. But we would much rather meet with you and do some planning before that happens and be able to get powers of attorney in place um, as the alternative to having to go to court and have a judge um, make the determination of who gets to act um, on behalf of somebody else. So that's just kind of a quick summary of what a guardianship and conservatorship is. Um, I do guess I need to explain that they are two different um, authorities. Um, the conservatorship governs money. The guardianship governs the person. So sometimes um, if assets aren't high, you can do just a guardianship. But oftentimes when family members are coming to me, uh, it is both a guardianship and conservatorship. You know, they have a house, bank accounts, retirement accounts. And so whoever's asking to be appointed is asking to be able to manage the person and finances. And so it's for a guardianship and conservatorship. So that's um, basically a, a pretty a broad stroke summary of what a guardianship conservatorship is. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you have some questions, you can feel free to ask um, general questions. Of course, if you have specific questions um, to your situation, we're happy to talk to you. We do a free consultation. Um, 
So uh, if you have specific questions to your situ situation, and um, we're happy to do that. But if you have general questions, if you want to let us know, we'd be happy to answer those as well. And another piece I frequently get asked, or we get phone calls when even though mom or dad are not incompetent, they are struggling with some of their executive functioning, and kids are fighting. Um, So-and-so is not doing the right thing. I want to be in charge. And that's where mom and dad can become you know, more like a child of divorce. They're gonna tell Susan what she wants to hear when she's in the room, and they're gonna tell, you know, Johnny what he wants to hear when he's in the room. And that's frequently a situation when there's, you know, interesting dynamics that a guardianship conservatorship is actually also the way to go. Because um, then mom and dad, you know, they're just torn and it just doesn't work in situations like that. Um, also, at times if so sometimes people will have a power of attorney in place and the person that's appointed them usually a parent and aunt and uncle spouse whoever and they're becoming difficult they're spendthrifts they're you know getting scammed sending money i had one client sending money to jamaica and it can be hard to get accounts shut down um, with just the power of attorney at times because it depends on how the bank is going to treat that you know, can you go in and say, you know what, we need two signatures on everything. I don't want mom, you know, being able to do anything over $500. So sometimes it can be more of a battle that of who can do what. Typically a letter from a physician that says, or maybe two, even though it's a durable power of attorney, a bank, a credit card company may not be willing to act um, unless there are letters that this person can't change their mind. They can't go back and forth because bank credit card company doesn't have any way to show or verify that mom's not capable of making those decisions anymore. So, you know, physician's letters sometimes are required, but every now and then push will come to shove in a guardianship or conservatorship. If mom or dad aren't acting in their best interest, you know, normally it can be avoided, but I've seen it sometimes with mental health issues that a guardianship does have to be put in place. Um, power of attorney, you know, it's revocable when somebody has capacity. So it can just get dicey, even though they essentially bear the same weight. Um, every now and then, you know, you kind of get pushed into that corner. Questions, anyone? Hmm. Rachel, anything else? <laughs> oh, and I would say, you know, Amber, when you and I were preparing, we talked about, um, I, I've had a situation recently where they actually had a power of attorney. And so um, you need to make sure you're reviewing it often because the power of attorney that they had was actually from 1996. And people who were listed had either passed or were in another state and they had, you know, taken care of their own loved ones and didn't think that they could do it from another state. Um, so even though there was a power of attorney in place, it didn't, we had to file and get a guardianship and conservatorship. So it's important that you do review the documents that you have and make sure you understand who's named and make sure that they are willing and still able to act, you know, on your behalf if um, something would happen and you need assistance. So it's just really important to keep reviewing those. Um, and make sure that they're updated. So we, we like to review them, you know, people call in and, and we'll take a look, you know, and look at the document. Um, because powers see. of attorney, they're revocable. So as long as you've got capacity, you can change your power of attorney anytime you want. So somebody falls to ill health, um, you know, dynamics go south. Person can always come back and say, you know what, I've listed you know, Susan is my power of attorney, but now I want to make it Johnny and here's why. And so it's always revocable and amendable as long as you've got the capacity to do so. And it, you know, it's also important to look at what the power of attorney covers because what I've seen quite a bit is somebody has a power of attorney and you know, when they tell me that it's, you know, three or four pages long or they got it off of the internet, um, you know, ours, I have to say, I'm, I know I'm biased, but ours are really good powers of attorney that look at long term, and we're an elder law firm, of course, and so ours really cover, um, you, 
a power of attorney, you can't just sign a piece of paper that says, I give Amber the ability to do everything on my behalf. You actually have to spell out what power you're giving your person you're naming to, to actually have and be able to do for you. And so ours are very comprehensive, long-term, and cover um, situations, you know, uh, Medicaid planning and things of that nature that many powers of attorney don't have. And so it's really important to talk to an elder care lawyer to make sure that the power of attorney you have is appropriate for your situation. So again, you know, I've reviewed power of attorneys, attorneys that are, are great, you know, if you're, you know, younger and not thinking about, you know, the needing the Medicaid planning or those pieces of the elder care journey, um, but uh, probably, you know, need to be updated as, as, as we do age. So it's important to look at who your agents are and what powers you have conveyed. And there are certain things that have to be listed um, statutorily, like being able to set up a trust or to make gifts. There are certain decisions. You can't just do the broad brushstroke. So you definitely want an attorney to do it if you're worried about anything degenerative, long term, it definitely needs to be an elder law attorney who takes a look at it. Because sometimes the documents other people prepared are fine. They cover it, can't hurt to take a look, don't need to reinvent the wheel, but sometimes they should be updated. Um, and you, the internet forms, I've just, of course we get the calls about this isn't working, but we had a client where the family was trying to, husband was in long term care, wife was at home, and we needed his IRA cashed in. Well, the son calls and says, hey, I've used this power of attorney at three other banks, but bank four won't honor it. Bank four was right. Um, it didn't have the required language in order for them to do what they've been doing. The first three banks missed it. It was kind of no harm, no foul. Nobody had been up to any shenanigans. But they, we actually were able to step in and put ours in place so they could make that happen. If a client hadn't had capacity they would have had to go the guardianship conservatorship route, which would have t probably taken a little while longer and, um, and to be able to access that asset. So it's important to make sure that, you know, at a minimum, an attorney does it. Definitely have an elder law attorney take a look at it. Probably a reason you're listening to us today. And um, internet forms are not just not. <laughs> Because if I often tell people, you know, if you ever run into an issue with our document, we're here to back it up. Call us every now and then a bank doesn't know what they're reading. Somebody called and said they needed letters of incapacity. No, you don't. Here's the paragraph. Go back to your bank. You're good. Um, if you've got an internet form, an online form, you know, legal zoom or whoever it is, Google isn't going to back it up. If you've got a problem, you're stuck with what you have. And if your loved one has lost capacity, you're going to be looking at a guardianship conservatorship to be able to, to get things done. And yes, I agree. It should be reviewed every now and then um, just to be sure that it's who you want set up the way that you want and that it's current and up to date. So Amber, I saw that we did actually have a question and it was whether or not our guardianship can be reversed. And that's a very good question. Um, yes, a guardianship can be if capacity is restored. It's always uh, reviewable by the court. And I should add that part of the process when you do petition for a guardianship or conservatorship, the ward, that's what the court calls the person that you're asking to have control of, is actually entitled to a statutory attorney. And the petitioner, so the person who's asking for the guardianship or conservatorship actually has to pay for that attorney for their loved one. So like, let's pretend that I'm filing to get guardianship or conservatorship of Amber. Um, she's required by statute to have her own attorney. And those fees, then I could potentially be responsible for having to pay for her to have the attorney. So there's a checks and balances in there so that somebody is meeting with the person and making sure that it's needed. And there is also testimony from doctors that's required um, there's a form in Kansas that doctors are actually, uh, we have doctors fill out. It's a little different in Missouri, but it, uh, we definitely are looking to make sure that capacity is not there. And if it is ever restored, yes, the court can um, set aside 
the guardianship or conservatorship. So, and um, I'm, I'm, I know that has um, been done sometimes in a, there's, in particular, like there was a case where there's a health situation where the person didn't have capacity. Um, and then once the issue was resolved and figured out, they then removed the guardianship. And then the person was actually able to do a power of attorney and appoint somebody to act on their behalf. So it is something that can be reviewed and set aside. Anybody else? That may be it for us for today. If you have specific questions that you wanted to ask, but you didn't want to ask in front of a crowd or other people um, that are specific to your situation, you can give us a call. Um, as Rachel mentioned earlier, the initial consult we don't charge for. Um, we'll ask you a few questions, make sure that we can actually be the, are the ones that can be helpful. Um, if not, we can refer you to the right people and see how we can be most helpful to you. Anything else, Rachel? It. Okay. Thanks everybody for attending and have a great day. Thank you.